Hey everybody, welcome back to another Stone Faced Reactions. I'm Theta, this is Lessons. We're here to watch another episode of SDF Macross. You know, before I get into anything else, the one thing that confused me is that I thought it was super dimensional Fortress Macross, but everything says super for, uh, dimension Fortress Macross. Yeah, I think dimensional is more of a translation thing, you know. Yeah, I've had to correct a number of little little tidbits and things I was writing beforehand. Well, uh, first off, I think we should go right back to the board. I already uh, tossed you that link. Are you on? Let me see. Coming up. Because, of course, we have to cover the last events of uh, Zero, and then our little transition into uh, Super Dimension Fortress Macross. Gonna cover a span of four years with the show, apparently. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Edgar LaSalle, I believe, is younger brother to Claudio LaSalle. I have Although no it's... evidence other than a name, but I just went ahead with it. Yeah. I don't know where I read that. If I'm wrong, I'm sure the comments, commenters will uh, correct Oh, yeah, that no, one. yeah, that'll happen. Um, Going up to the uh, Macross Zero board real quick. Of course, we have the people that died. Um, But also, who the hell knows? Birdman, Shin, Sarah. So I've just question marked them. They're not dead as far as I'm concerned, but it is what it is. I mean, it seems that they just went somewhere. We don't know where they went, but they went poof. You know? Yeah, you know, I've got a we theta's do, thoughts. We see a speak of light going like that. So. I've got a theta's thoughts comment that'll, that'll cover this, but mm -hmm. for now, I put them in question mark, and I'm assuming that's never going to be unquestion marked unless they make another prequel property. Yeah, I mean... Or, my, or yeah. my thought is right. One of those two. Uh, how will Maury's not want to go back on stuff? Mostly. Oh, sorry, it's a pollen day here. Mm -hmm. uh, not, not good. Not good. Uh, but yeah, now I've included uh, what now? We have one, two, three, four, five, sixth color, yellow, to represent is Roy Fucker is Roy Fucker. Otherwise, uh, any other thoughts about uh, where we are in the current timeline? Any of this not representational of what's actually happening? Uh, I'm going to say this is going to grow and go more, more complicated as the series goes, yeah. Dude, you haven't seen my Gundam one and the headache I had just half an hour ago trying to edit the Legend of the Galactic Heroes one that I've got for Ooh, season. Yeah, no, that, that one is going to be always going to be... We just yeah. finished recording Legend of the Galactic Heroes one for uh, season two, where everybody gets promoted or is dead, and the Kaiser just died, and it's like, oh my god, I think I'm just going to move all the dead people down into a dead people area. <laughs> I mean, it is a war story. Yeah. Uh, and this one in particular, I mean... Legends really likes to kill their characters. Well, yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, we have everybody that's on board the crew. I believe this guy was another pilot. So yeah, the uh, the connective green line that goes through everybody is just everybody that's a member of the crew of the Macross. Well, Maximilian hasn't appeared yet. He I did. Think we saw in the shorts in the. Uh... He he did. He, well, we didn't get his name, so kind of the name is a spoiler. But we he was in episode one. Uh, he uh, is one of the pilots that's uh, fighting, isn't he? I don't think so. I'm pretty sure. Sorry. I think we saw him in the in the picture book. In Here's the back. that's what. I, no, yeah. no, that's look here. I've got it up. Um, where did I put it? Here we go. Oops, sorry for everyone. <laughs> Sorry, when I bring up a screen on my third screen, it uh, blanks out the Discord, so that's why that went gray all of a sudden. Maximilian Janus appears at minute seven in the episode one, which is when they're going through uh, all the pilots. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. Just to make sure, because I'm very anal retentive about this, just to make sure that I don't miss anybody, because I don't know who anybody is. Right? 
I always go through a listing of who appears for the first time when in a show when I'm making these up. And at that timestamp, we're looking at the pilots. So I just assumed he was one of the pilots because one of them has a hair color that looks like his. Well, I mean, hair color. Because, I mean, to the same token. God, which one is she? I think it's Vanessa Liard. You only see her face for half a second. Otherwise, she's in the room with the chamois and Misa. With her head turned back, looking away. So Yeah. But she's clearly there, because when she looks, she looks like that with the glasses and everything. And, of course, uh, your boy Hikaru here isn't on the crew yet, so I just have him tied to uh, Roy. Because they've got their little backstory thing going on. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, Lin May and Igushio here, who she's there at the show with? I mean, I don't really... She's there yeah, he for was a, a little, speech. He, he's a little boy that is... Uh, oh, no, no, I know he's want... the boy who had to pee and everything, or wants to oh, yeah. drink. I'm just saying, I don't know why they're there. It's like, for it's not really an air show. It's an air show happens to happen, because Roy makes it happen. It's just, they're there for the speech, I guess? So it just I mean, it's supposed to be the long ceremony of the ship. That was the day they were supposed to, and they were showing like different military hardware and stuff like that. So it was kind of an air show part of it, right? It was think of it as a, you know, it was a celebration of the of the of the finishing the work with the the Macross. That's what everybody was talking about. I don't know because it didn't seem that way because it's the guy uh, who just paid a lot of money to help the Macross get built is uh, presenting the captain, and the mayor is just off in the fucking city somewhere. Like, he wouldn't be part of this if it was the big event. And it's, like, a smallish crowd, too. That's what I'm saying. It seems like, well, as we were saying when we were watching, you were saying the Blue Angels. It seems just like a, just a little impromptu thing. Yeah, but also they say that he kind of has an, a specific invitation. Right? So there, it, this is probably... Uh... You know, invitation, maybe by family. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I was like covering, that. like, why Min May and Yoshio were there. I already know why Hikaru was there. He sh he says it himself. Yeah. And, of course, otherwise, just these two. The bad guys. The aliens. Who I've only directly connected as an enemy to the captain, because I guess he's in this, is going to represent the the Macross when it comes to that, because otherwise I'm going to tie a little red line to everybody, and I'm not going to do that. And it might be a read-in, but, you know, these two spent the night together, even though Roy is staring at Min May's ass by the end. Yeah. I'm attaching the, the romance line to them, because who the hell knows? Well, obviously you do, but I don't. <laughs> it just seemed that way to me. Even though it seems very clear to me, uh, Roy is getting set up for Misa by Claudia. I think it was more of a joke. I think it was like, oh, you want him too, right? Kind of thing, but yeah. I mean, it could, sure, it could be a joke, but it also could be like foreshadowing, so who the hell knows? Again, you do, but don't tell me. Um. Okay. Well, that is the board, and I'll just leave that up there for the time being. Otherwise, I've got some thoughts to go through here. Unless you want to go first, if you have any thoughts from last episode, or zero again for the last time. Yeah, I mean, the fact that it put Zero at 2008 and this series at 2009, it seems a bit sort of very narrow window between the two of them, right? Uh, so it's like, oh. And, oh, although maybe, remember you were saying that, oh, these guys fire first. Maybe the the events of Zero kind of, you know, the, 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 the top leadership is like, no, oh, these alien stuff is too dangerous. We just can't let them anything. We got to destroy them before they even show up, right? Otherwise, they're going to blow the planet up. Right? You know, it's funny you say that because I went and wrote all my thoughts down for Zero first. And then I started rewatching the first episode of Macross. And I have a specific thought in uh, my Zero uh, comments that hung with me. And I started rethinking it entirely in the very first seconds of the Macross episode. I'm like, oh wait, never mind. This is back, <laughs> back before Zero even happened. The fact that Macross starts with the backstory of the whole series threw me off completely from my thoughts on Zero for half a second. 
obviously you don't know what those are, so it doesn't mean anything right now. Yeah. So, I mean, still, the fact that they opened fire and you know, destroyed the ship was like, well, you're in it now, either way. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, well, I guess I'll get into my zero thoughts here first then, so I can get into the Macross thoughts and then go back and forth with you on that. This is kind of like my wrap-up on Zero, so it'll be all Macross, uh, SDF Macross from here on out after this. Uh, my apologies for not doing a recap last episode of Zero. It probably would have helped to understand the events of the episode ever so slightly, so that's my bad. I realized we didn't do that. No, we were got, a, got right into it. Uh, I know I was flippant during Dr. Turner's death, but it was rather sad in the rewatch. I feel like had this been a longer series and not an OVA, that they really could have done more with her and her backstory to make her death feel even more impactful. Uh, instead, despite the fact that they have a long and involved backstory together, one which decided the course of their careers, in fact, uh, Roy's moved on in a single year, which I still think is uh, it's a thing. Uh, so in that respect, I feel a little less sad about my flippancy. Yeah, I mean, again, that's the thing about prequels. They always contain a little bit of a retcon, right? In that, oh, we want to have Roy in this series because we want to have a connection people recognize, right? And we get part of his backstory. Uh, you remember that that uh, in, in Macross, he was like, oh, you should have been with the circus. You should have been with my dad, whatever. You promised, but you, you, you were a murderer, right? You kept fighting this war. And he's like, dude, there was a war, right? And of course, now we watch Zero. We're like, yeah, we seen what the, you know, we have a taste of what the war was. So it's like, oh, okay, Roy is a more serious character than what we see originally. But it kind of feels off, you know, it feels off because like, no, he's very serious. Yeah, he made some jokes about women and all that, but he was like, no, this tragic backstory about this woman that I could have spent my life with, I should have stayed with you in the airport, whatever. And it's like, okay, I'm gonna start at. at women's skirts and my could be girlfriends making jokes about me sleeping with other women. So, you know, yeah, I mean, I don't have a problem with trying to fit in retcon or, you know, two things that don't fit together, uh, into my head, just making it a head cannon, mm -hmm. especially cause we're watching it in chronological order and not in the order of release. So that's mm -hmm. on us, but I enjoy that more so because I can then have to, I then get to try and put together the story of the show rather than the story of the writers, which are two different stories sometimes. I mean, it's more like a tonal shift, right? And it might seem a bit of tonal clash a little bit, you know. Right, right. But again, I want to take in the world that's being built rather than the the writer's room <laughs> that, was a, that was present for the writing. Yeah. Uh, let's see. What I will say uh, I feel sad for is the end of the show. I know I've never had this conversation with you specifically, but sometime, uh, something I've often directed at the audience over the years uh, that we've been doing this channel is that I reacted differently to shows when I watched them on my own versus watching them with y'all. Uh, when I was rewatching the last episode of Zero to take notes and adjust the board, I choked up a little bit and said, shed some uh, tears because... The, the scenes hit harder when I'm by myself, when I'm, like, not trying to be a little bit funny or something, right? So, uh, especially once that ending song starts to play, which I believe is called Holy Raz, uh, got me real choked up as I listened just to read the lyrics, which, by the way, talk about looking up and seeing the stars, Sarah's whole message to Shin while he was working on the generator, essentially, was this song. So much for that was more for the audience, but it was also me explaining to you that yeah, I'm not no entirely flippant all the time. It's just, it's hard to be, I don't know, I've had this conversation with Griff. It's hard to be more emotional when you know somebody else is in the right next to you or watching you or something. I don't know. For me, yeah, anyway, it, it, it makes the, um, the scenes that I'm actually like, shut up, man, I'm crying. It makes <laughs> those scenes more impactful to me when they hit me so hard that I break through all of that. And, like, if for uh, 86, for example, or Made in Abyss, shows like that have managed to 
to pull through. Whereas this, apparently, I was... That's pretty funny. You know, I, I made a joke when she coughed up blood over him because I was thinking of some child in the scene, like, ew, gross. You know, even though it's a touching love moment where one of them's dying. Uh, let's see. It was really uh, Dr. Hasford's own hubris that ended him. He thought he knew better and decided to school the mystical island girl on their own beliefs. Something that even Dr. Turner didn't fully get off uh, track for. He claimed that the Song of Destruction and Creation were two sides of the same coin. In uh, her final moments, Dr. Turner surmised that they weren't two sides, but actually the same thing. We know the Birdman would have wiped us out in the end, but both Turner and Hasford thought, in different ways, that this uh, destruction would cause creation. Hasford thought it would create the peace to end the war, at first anyways. Then as he was uh, dying, he realized what Dr. Turner did, that it would end the war by destroying us and creating a new one. I mean, on its face, that is wrong, because this war is happening, or got exacerbated, because of the presence of an alien ship, right? It's like, oh, you're fighting with and over the technology of the aliens because you got alien access to alien tech. So it's like, how could you think? I mean, it's like when people talk about in fantasy gods of destruction, you know, these death cults, and you always have the death cult leader going like, oh, no, my god is going to create a new world out of the old and blah, blah, blah. And you're like, no, nah, I'm going to have to kill you now. And you just stab them because you know it's it's stupid, right? It's like you know it's it it comes to a point where tearing down everything just leads to nothing, right? Well, I think I mentioned this. I think I've mentioned this fucking every episode now. Eon, Greg Bear, the book, right? Mm -hmm. The asteroid goes into orbit, describes World War Three. They try to hide it, the information that's in the asteroid, for fear that it'll cause a war, and it does. It causes the war it describes. Which, by the way, there are still humans in the asteroid, and they're just way off, and it's hard to describe. Anyway, it is their biggest regret that the asteroid... I'm going to just ruin something here. The asteroid winds up in a different universe. Essentially, it's, um, it's the engines on the asteroid slingshot it from one universe to another. So it's basically a different Earth. And their largest regret is that they've caused another Earth to go through what they've gone through. So, it's like, what do you mean? <laughs> Where are these humans from? But, I mean, it's essentially the same thing. You know, the yeah. aliens caused the war they're trying to uh, avoid. By the way, Birdman's beam seemed a lot like Macross's beam, except from a smaller ship and took a lot less time to charge up. I have yeah. to wonder if that implies it's just higher tech than even the alien tech we rebuilt. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, there's talk about the supervision army and the protoculture. Like I mentioned, protoculture is like the original culture, literally. And the intention is that they were the ones who created everything else, one way or another. And so, yeah, they have the highest tech, right? Yeah, because I mean, it's like a fighter craft doing a Macross beam. The Macross being the biggest ship there is. All right, well, here's my last thought on Zero, and is essentially my wrap-up of how I think the ending, my interpretation of the ending. Do you think, given, what they, uh, given that they said the Birdman could time travel and teleport, that the Mayan myth uh, is Sarah and Shin? Rui uh, Kano, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce it. Rui Kano... The first human that had his tail and fins cut off, aka, sh aka Shin emerging from the ruins of his jet, which, by the way, was submerged underwater before it got raised up to flash through the air after Sarah, and Rui Waka, his wife, which came from the, uh, when the Birdman cut off its own head, aka the Birdman removes its cockpit head and Sarah comes out who had many children together, then eventually leave the planet to travel across the stars, that they went back in time, and that is, uh, and that this is all a self-fulfilling process of, uh, process of, 
Words. Words are hard sometimes for yeah. lessons. Prophecy, yeah. yeah. Prophecy slash paradox. Since Shin's whole lesson was to be one with and understand nature, and given the fact that he was on the path to understanding the mystical nature of the harmony and life on the island through music, it doesn't seem like he'd have much of a problem being in the past. I mean, that's one interpretation. And the reason why I don't pivot to that is because it seems, you know, plausible entirely, but seems too many steps. I'm a big believer in simpler explanation. Like, my simple explanation is they, they just took off. Like, they're like, okay, this is not going to work. This is too dangerous. Let's go to space and do our own thing, right? That's what I was saying uh, when I first started watching the or rewatching the first episode of Macross again, and the alien ship comes down and crashes. I'm suddenly thinking, oh, wait, did Shin and Sarah go off and like meet the aliens? And did they send the ship back to Earth? To It's like, oh, wait, no, wait, this happens before that. It's like I just totally forgot for half a second. Um, you're saying too many steps. It's literally two steps. <laughs> that's that's why I'm not too bothered by it being, if that's I the mean, case. I mean, it can be. It can be. And then you have the implication that over the centuries, right, it became a myth, so they didn't really understand the lesson, which then sets up the paradox of them. Well, know. the paradox is actually where did Birdman come from? Because the paradox yeah. would be Birdman's here causes the events that happen, then goes back into the past carrying Shin and Sarah. In which case, Birdman create is always there. Where did original Birdman come from? It's a bootstrap paradox. But, yeah, but also it's did when they go to the past, did Shin and Sarah deliberately modify? Well, no, they wouldn't have to modify. The uh, the myth contains the fact that they have lots of children. So it would literally just be an Adam and Eve situation of, I know there's the whole, there's not enough genetic diversity thing right there, but honestly, the Bible doesn't worry with it. Why do we have to worry about it? Sure. The idea would be is that they just have all the children that turn into all the people of Earth or whatever. Or that there's already, you know, that there's already a nascent human species in which their children then you know, futz around with, if you want to say, but, uh... Yeah. But like I said, it doesn't answer where the Birdman originally comes from, and it's a whole time paradox thing, but they repeat the myth, their origin myth, like, three or four times to the point where you can just see everything attaching to one another. And why did they say it could time travel? If it could, right? I mean, again... I think the time travel thing is, in a way, you have to time travel in order to go faster than light. But I think that's the part. I know. think that's just a, a matter of it happening. But at the same time, that just makes everything around you faster uh, time-wise. Time slows down for you. Then that's not really time. Well, I guess you could consider it time travel, but it's not the... You wouldn't consider redshift time travel. You would just consider that an effect. Yeah, but that's up to the point of light speed. In order for you to go faster than light speed, in a way, you have to be faster. Actually, no. And go back in time. That's not true, because most of the time, well, at least in sci-fi, when you're traveling faster than light, you're you're doing things that break uh, known physics already. Like, hyperspace does not involve time travel. Folding space does not involve uh, time travel. Um, wormholes can involve time travel, so maybe that's the odd one out. But you I can't go faster than light. Well, I mean, you can't go faster than light and have mass is the problem. And this is supposed to be some kind of folding of space. That's what that's what they call it. They call it fold. Well, so that's, well, supposed that's to be, here's yeah. the problem. Uh, here, I'll get into this right now because I wrote something about folding space here for the, the Macross, um, the SDF Macross one. Um, ba -ba -ba, where did I write this? Oh, Given uh, that when the Macross appeared in 1999 and then the alien fleet in 2009, both were preceded with the blinding strobe lights of white light. I guess that is how FDL is presented to us in this universe. Based on conversations between Kredanik and Fulmo, I don't know which parts of their names we're going to use, but we're going to use the ones I can pronounce at best. At first, I was going to guess folded space was our method due to the refold comment, but
but then they say hyperspace. I mean, no reason they couldn't be using multiple different methods, especially if there are multiple different tech levels. Yeah, that's also true. Because I had guessed, oh, they're using folded space when the guy's like, and there's no refold? As if to say, did they fold their way back out? <laughs> you know, is there yeah. another... Is there another signature to say that they folded space again? But then after, right after that, he says there's like talk he talks about hyperspace. And it's like, well, I'm watching a lot of Babylon 5 these days, so <laughs> that is different from folded space. I would say folding space is closer to a wormhole than it is hyperspace. I mean, it, if you if you try to get too granular on FTL, you're going to lose this grade because it's like it's just the way we go from point A to point B. Well, right? I'm talking more in the uh, the space of sci-fi fans, right? Yeah, yeah. Not actual physicists, which are neither you and I. Unless you no, got no, a I know, but I'm saying that PhD on that five, blurb wall behind yeah. you. Uh, yeah. Uh, in Babylon Five, when uh, they asked the creator of uh, Michael Sosinski, you know, what's how fast the ship goes, and he basically said they go at the speed of the plot. You know, you it's know, interesting. Ultimately, it's Ultimately, a, that's what it what what is always about. Well, it's interesting because the planet that uh, Babylon Five rotates around is actually they name it, and it's like the third distant, most distant, not third most distant, third closest planet to Earth. So, I mean, all a person has to do is like, okay, well, was there any point in this show where they said how long it's been since they left Babylon Five? It's like it takes a week to get to Mars, so we can do the math. I mean, the thing is that he wants to avoid... It's like uh, star dates in Star Trek, right? The reason why you have star dates is because you don't want to assign it to a real year, even though people have done that. Yeah, but the same. Like, yeah, it's like, uh, yeah, because it, one episode, say, it takes a week, but in another episode, say, it takes three weeks. It's like, which one is it, right? Or a month or two, whatever, right? That's the fluctuating nature of Star Trek, though, right? Because that warp travel fluctuates. Warp 1 and or OTOS... Is not the same as Warp One and TNG. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Uh, going into the uh, the Macross thoughts now. Is going to take a bit for the Macross opening song to grow on me. Macross Zero's soundtrack was for the most part amazing, and it seems like a disservice to directly uh, compare SDF Macross to it, given the twenty five years of musical evolution between them. Uh, something I noticed in the opening, though, the mechs are fighting these ball pod things on the ground. Per our previous conversation about the aliens being giants, which I hope isn't supposed to be some huge reveal, because if it is, I apologize ahead of time for having known it. The ball things are not appreciably larger than the human mechs, though, making me think, do the aliens use drone technology? Is that why their aircraft seem to be the same size as our jets? I hope it really isn't a perspective thing that they are they were much larger but very far away. I will not comment about this because I won't. I think in the first episode I also made the joke that maybe they have a, a much smaller subservient race. But I think I was making that joke because Fulmo is so much smaller than whatever that other guy's name who starts with a K. Uh, interesting note, according to the text of the narrator, the SDF Macross is only 400 meters shorter than an Imperial Star Destroyer. Yeah, it's still over a kilometer long, so yeah. It's I a don't think it's, yeah. Yeah, it's 12, kilo, uh, what, 12 1. kilometers, 2, I think. Yeah. No, 1.2 1. Uh, meters. 1,200 kilometers, yeah, I'm just meters. doing the math wrong. 1,200 kilometers. Meters, not kilometers, because it were 1,200 kilometers. <laughs> I mean, that would be... Here's my yeah. thing. As I took all these notes earlier, and I'm just getting confused by my own writing. That's okay. Yeah, yeah, because an Imperial Star Destroyer, Mark II and Mark I are 1,600 meters. So, again, just a little bit shorter. So if you ever want to put it in perspective in your head, the fact this thing is like a flying city or something like that, whatever you think about the Macross, you can also think about an Imperial Star Destroyer. Uh, let's see, Roy's conversation with Akaru about his promise to Hakaru's dad and how he couldn't live up to it after he'd started uh, piloting fighters 
just adds to the things Roy's bailed on since the start of the war, given what we learned of his backstory in the prequel. Yeah, he bailed on a girlfriend, then he bailed on... Actually, he wasn't supposed to be an archaeologist? Yeah, I was going to say, Dr. Turner yeah. had this whole thing about why did you give up history? And now, to think that he also was bailing on the circus at the same time? Like, can you imagine Roy doing flying shows at the circus with, like, a stack of history books, like, <laughs> trying to get his PhD? Because he's got this girlfriend waiting for him at the, the train station. But also... You know, this is a lot. I'm doing a lot here. I'm just going to sign up for the military. <laughs> Which usually is the opposite of some people who want to join the military. It's like, I got no future. I just want to join the army. I don't know. You know. Roy had a lot on his plate. It's just weird. <laughs> Roy's backstory. I can't yeah. wait for another show to come around. Like one of the ones where apparently a movie is happening based on these characters. So it gives Roy a third backstory. Roy was complicated. We could not figure him out. We just wrote him a new thing. Uh, let's see. You had mentioned before that some higher authority likely commanded them to open fire on the alien ships. On rewatch, I didn't see that at all. Before them across fires, the communication they get is from the carrier in orbit, reporting that it detected the signatures of the aliens in space. Uh, after them across fires, the captain calls for a level 1 combat alert, and we see the space carrier launching all its fighters, uh, and then opening fire on the alien ships. There's nothing in between. In fact, after the carrier goes down, Captain Global, and by the way, I fucking hate that name, Captain <laughs> Global says to himself that a conversation with the Earth Defense Council the previous day covered that if aliens were ever to be encountered, that under no circumstances were they to initiate hostilities. So maybe Captain Global didn't start the war with his combat order? since the carrier is another ship, but the carrier went directly against the Defense Council's orders, and we certainly still are the ones that attacked first. I mean, yeah. Uh, that part is on the line. Yeah. I guess we're never going to find out what the fuck the carrier captain was going to think was thinking, given that they had orders, and he went right against it, or she went right against it. Maybe another prequel series. Also interesting that despite us drawing first blood, the fact we rebuilt lost technology is the reason why the aliens give for being unable to justify destroying us. I mean, they don't know that how much it's it's a I think it's a combination of they don't know what they're they not no no what they it's not even a combination it's like okay, this is new, right? If we just blow them up, then we don't find out what's going on, right? Well, um, Fulmo says to Kiradak, God, I'm going to zoom in real quick. What's his name? Kradanik. That sounds like a Star Trek Voyager villain. Um, Fulmo says to Kradanik something about uh, how we rebuilt uh, reactive technology. And Kradanik is like almost exasperated, like downtrodden at hearing that. Because like, Oh man, now we can't justify destroying them. Like, I don't know. When I hear reactive technology, for one, I'm going to think back to Zero with the whole how the armor falls off, and they call it reactive armor instead of ablative armor, which that seems like to me. But when I hear well, reactive technology, I'm thinking like, I don't know, uh, like propellant and missiles and shit, not like high tech. Yeah. If you go back to Shiro when they show the nukes, which uh, Shiro actually calls them nukes later on, you don't see a nuclear signal uh, sign. You see like a triangle thing, which seems like a nuclear sign. That is, I think, it's a sign of reactive technology. Well, yeah, no, no, they say it too. Well, when the missiles are being fired, they say nuclear missiles. But before that, when they're saying get ready for, what is it? The Iconoclast, it's not the project, was it? Iconoclast. Uh, Protocol? Hey, protocol, yeah. It's iconoclasm. Yeah. They say, when they say the iconoclasm protocol, that's they say get ready with the reactive or reactor missiles or whatever. So before one person says nuclear, somebody else says the R word. I am paying the smallest amount of attention, given my bad memory. Yeah. Uh, all right. Do you have any other thoughts? Because those are all of me. Uh, I mean... 
except for the what seems to be discrepancies, which are easily uh, assigned to the fact that it's a prequel that was done, you know, over two decades later. It makes sense, right? Uh, I actually do like the, the song, even though, again, in my head, when I see a scene, it's some music from that other interpretation, which I will now repeat because then the comment section is going to set me on fire virtually. Um, I would say that, yeah, I actually I do like the song very much. It's very, very 80s anime, you know. Uh, this if you one. remember, th- yeah, a Macross one. Um, well, they're all Macross. Remember stuff- yeah, no, no, but I mean the STF one, uh, the core series. Uh, if people are watching so like Messenger Z or stuff like that, yeah, it's uh, in that vein, right? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I think I mentioned this immediately when we heard it. It's a little bit better than the Gundam song, the OG Gundam song. I don't know what which Gundam would be running per- parallel to this one. We're certainly not there in our reactions. But I was comparing it to the OG one, and because this comes out 15 years after that, so to it's better than that because it's almost like an 80s song. It is an 80s song, don't get me wrong. I understand that this was made in the 80s, but when I think of like 80s, I'm thinking like, uh, well, you know, like Rush and all them. I'm thinking like bands and shit that I would listen to, and this almost sounds like a, a contemporary song of theirs. Not of theirs, of the time. Sorry, my brain is all over the place. Whereas, you know, you go back to the original Gundam, it's like, Gundamu, Gundamu. And they're like raising their hands in the sky for the light and everything. It's very, what, 13, 14 years after the original anime, which would have been Mighty Adam. Yeah. So, it is itself at least a step up. It's just going to take me time to, to get used to it. Well, not even that, just to hear it a bunch. Right, the more you hear it, the more I'm going to be indoctrinated. So, <laughs> uh, but yeah, any other thoughts, or is that it? No, oh, I'm I'm ready to watch episode two. Okay, well, let's go ahead and get into it. But first, uh, before we get started, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, and comment down below to feed that algorithm. On top of all that, if you want to watch more shows like this, unfiltered, uncensored, and uncut, as well as some early access stuff, you can check it out. Over on the Patreon, it's five dollars a month, but hey, no pressure. It's all to support the channel and a little bit extra. It's kind of funny. He does the the head look up thing, like he's focusing or whatever. But we know he uh-huh. fell asleep in a cockpit. <laughs> I guess I didn't really uh, examine the lyrics of the song yet. Because it's so far about the Macross itself striking the earth. Especially given Shin's description of it. I think that's my biggest, uh, my biggest thing so far is that I'm now tied to Shin and Sarah being the best uh, romantic duo in the series. And I'm entering into this. Like, Shin was very quickly tied to Sarah in the uh, the prequel. Yeah. And I can't even tell if... I guess Shin did see Min Mei by virtue of trying to figure out where Roy's eyes were going. Certainly didn't see her face. <laughs> well, no, maybe he did. With uh, Yoshi playing around with the, the drink machine. Yeah. I also think this is very interesting. The fact we focus on the, uh... Are we still calling them Valkyries? Yeah. That we focus on the Valkyrie there in front of a part of the Macross. Even though the song is about the Macross. The show is called Macross. You know, Gundam is named after the Gundams. You'd think if this show was about the Valkyries, the show would be called Valkyrie. Not White Base. Yeah. I mean, Gundam Seed isn't called Archangel. Also, yeah, the scene right there. Notice those were all the names of animation studios. Yeah. 
These guys also took part in Daikon, right? Daikon yeah. 4. They sent waves and waves of their own men. Glad I made that joke and then they described it as a wave. Mm. Prometheus,に紹介ヘリの出動要請を頼む。あと5分で到着するはずです。気が利くだ。どうも。Oh, your boy here also clearly killed a man when he landed. Not even assuming that there was nobody in those buildings. There was a dude like in front of one of them who just gets obliterated. Yeah. Winning your by lands here. Okay, so Min May's parents. Um. I don't know, because I don't know if they change stuff from what I remember, so... Well, I mean, she lives there, and they look the right age. Yeah, these are the alien pods I must have seen in the intro. This is Independence Day. Helicopters never survive the elite. Yeah. Oh, ですので、ガイオペイのあらまに。で、マクロスは発信するのかね。走って。ま、それはそうですな。ね、ちょっと。このまま宇宙に出ちゃうの?宇宙に出て戦闘可能なアームドツとドッキングしたまえ。どうや
<laughs> you remember he's on the radio with literally the person who told him how to transform it? Yeah. So instead of having this conversation with the trained military personnel, he's having it with a civilian in their window. Okay, so they're the romance of the show this time. I could have guessed. She's the only civilian... female civilian we've seen. I wonder what they would have done in the prequel if Roy had worn a cravat like he's wearing. That was smart. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to be fair, we did see Shin fuck up a lot, too. And Shin was apparently better than Hikaru was. I'm concerned that one of her screens had a nuclear, or at least a mushroom cloud on. Had it been nuclear, it was above, you know, a certain height line. Yeah, interesting note, those little reactor-looking things. The, um, aircraft carrier from Zero had one. Yeah. So it looked like the music was floating it, but it was also floating on its own at one point. Yeah. Looks like yeah. we didn't secure them, sir. <laughs> yeah, brace for impact. How did you land on cars, but also in the exact same position you landed in? You were in before takeoff. It should have, like, I guess it should have been first the collapses and then the cars are squished. Yeah. I say, why wouldn't you think it would fall backwards? Yeah. Uh... Oh, glad that all happened off screen. <laughs> Only ten. <laughs> I gotta teach a kid how to pilot a super expensive combat weapon. Yeah. 
You're the only part of the city destroyed by friendly fire. Yeah. Smart that they started running. It's like, oh no, not another one. Oh shit. Let's go. Apparently every shop front is filled with the same mannequins. Why are you two still up there? それより、なんで戦闘機をロボットなんかするんですか。わけは今はいけんな。軍の秘密ってやつですか。当たりだ。お前軍人になるぞ。冗談でしょ。それよりなんとかしてくださいよ。ママ、俺なら五分もするやん
Good thing we invented these hybrid weapons before we ever knew that we would need them. There you get your, your size comparison. That's gonna have to be a rewatch thing, because I did not pick that up. Because all the ones that have been nearish each other, I know you're talking about the first person leans in and buzzes through the cockpit. All of these don't seem that big. Well. I'm not really trying to compare it to the hybrid mode. I'm trying to compare it to the full robot mode, which now I can tell is not that big, it's bigger. That was a risk. You know this guy is shit at the uh, controls. I would not trust him with, like, how tight can the fist go. That's true. Can't hear you! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What about the little boy? Where'd he go? No, he's with, it, with the other adults. He didn't leave. <laughs> it's got the appropriate music for all this. Him falling out of the cockpit, too. She's taking everything in stride today. <laughs> Say, look forward. Yes, yeah, I'm saying they're not that much bigger because they're like three fourths of legs. That was a shit move, though. Okay, that's better explanation. This dude just looks fucking human. Yeah. He didn't have a green face or anything. Yeah, his foot's the size of a car. That, yeah, that is actually impossible. We did not know about them. I guess 
I guess to be fair, even though there was no dead bodies in the Macross when it crashed, it could have had consoles and seats and shit. I mean, yeah, the size of the ship was like, oh, this must be for either a lot of people or some very big people. <laughs> this is where I die, because I hit under the things. I get cooked alive. I just don't think the size works out. That fucking giant could not fit in that little ball. So it gets out of his robot back into his prop plane. <laughs>初めてのフォールドがどのような結果をもたらすのか、敵も当のグローバル自身でさえ全く予測は不可能だった。マクロスは新たな選曲を迎える。次回、超時空要塞マクロススペースフォールド。Mr. <laughs> narrator is having fun. Yeah. Yeah, no, I don't think the ball size on the walkers bits for having that guy inside of it because he uh, yeah. he must be squished up near time because <laughs> i mean what i think i don't like about this is the sort of shaky cam before shaky cam like literally somebody got handed it a 1980s you know camcorder going like you know. well i can't remember the history of uh, handheld recording I remember uh, Red Letter Media I mean, did a thing about it. Yeah, but I don't know when it got when that was released. I think in 1980, 1981, the big ones with the with the shoulder camera, you know, recorder, and the camera was in the shoulder. Yeah, those are 1980s. Right, are we talking news media or the home release version, where you had the over the mount thing where you kept your recording software, and then the yeah. the shoulder mounted. Yeah. I think by 1983, the ones that were that had the tape on the machine, on the that existed, but they were still pretty big, you know. But yeah, there's also I would say the discrepancy between the size of the giant and the other stick around it. Like his foot crushed a car, to indicate that his foot was as big as a car. But then you stand him up next to the hybrid mode of the Valkyrie, and the Valkyrie's foot's nowhere near that size. Not even the foot. The Valkyrie is like the size of three cars in a row. That's about the size of a two-story building? Well, this dude is bigger than the buildings around him. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just saying, like, this guy's foot was the size of a car. And the Valkyrie is the size of a normal, like, F-14 or whatever, right? So, A it's, little smaller, yeah. Yeah, so it's like the length of a couple of cars put together. But his foot is so much smaller in the shot where the two things are together than that. So I'm saying his foot is changing sizes between scenes. Yeah. The foibles of animation. Yeah, well. I mean, what, what's your takeaway from this episode? Uh, I think it really illustrates the threat that they're confronting, right? That they're, you know... And the first is like, oh, we're going to have a couple of uh, ships fighting, whatever. And then, you know, the big gun destroy a couple of them. So like, okay, they're in danger. But now we know that the Macross is, they don't really understand the technology because it got, you know, the anti-grav things got ripped out of the ship. And they're in a desperate situation, both politically as well as militarily. Like the politicians is like, oh, hey, you better launch some Macross because it would be a shame if we wasted all this money. And like. God damn it. And in, in a more modern anime, the captain would be going like, God damn you to hell. You know, something like that, but yeah. Well, I mean, we know that they're beholden to a civilian government. Mm -hmm. We just don't know if the Earth Defense Council is a civilian entity or if it's uh, a military entity. 
I mean, it could be a civilian oversight committee, or you know, it could be a higher, a higher level like admiralty board. Who the hell knows? Yeah. Well, yeah. maybe you do, don't but I don't. Anything. If I knew once, I don't remember right now. Well, I mean, they're the only other ones that we we get acknowledged by. Otherwise, this is just some dude. Um, we also don't know if the um, Macross, its outer hull, is composed of the uh, the alien material or if it's all just rebuilt human material. Well, if you go to the time, you know, timeline they did early on, it episode had a lot one. of episode one had a lot of rents and openings in the outer hall. So my guess is that when they rebuild it, they have to recover it with Earth material, otherwise it would have been exposed to space. So yeah. Well, my only thought on that is we saw what happened to the Earth cr uh, carrier in orbit when it got shot up by those lasers, and they just ripped like right through it, like almost precision beam shit. So we already know that they're not shooting them across; they're literally shooting all around it. But if it's human material, then when they do eventually shoot it, it's just going to go fucking through the ship. It should anyway, given the what we already got shown. Otherwise, if it's alien material, then maybe it's harder than that. I guess I'm just giving them enough room to make plot armor. Other than that, because yeah. if we do just write it off as human shit, then maybe the inside of the ship is fine, but we're just going to get like lots of openings to space. Yeah, I think it's like the foot. It it depends on on what they want to go for, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, that's what I'm saying. I have no expectations. So, uh, any other thoughts? Um, well, Roy apparently can't get his dead girlfriend out of his mind, apparently, because he's always looking at every skirt that he he, he watches. Is like, you know, I mean, some people are like that though. So I guess I'm not gonna like get too down on Roy. Yeah, because you know, it kind of felt like he was that way even when his girlfriend was alive. He's just a horn dog. <laughs> Sorry. It was literally a different time. Oh. Anyway, oh. I think that's it for uh, this episode of Macross. Uh, once again, I've been Theta. This is Lessons. We'll catch you next time. Bye bye. Hey, everybody. Thanks for watching another Stone Face Reactions. If you have an idea of another video we could go ahead and watch, go ahead and put it in the comments down below, and we'll add it to the wheel. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and let us know what you thought about this video and what parts you liked. And until then, we'll see you next time. Is this too goofy? <laughs>